good evening everyone uh, this is asmita good evening sir sir you are muted i can't hear you better yeah so a uh, very very good evening everyone again uh, i am asmita center head at jamshedpur management association and i welcome you all on behalf of jma to this els session enriching life series on the dark side of entrepreneurship we have a very interesting topic today with a very interesting speaker so i would like to first give a short introduction of our speaker today professor s ram kumar uh, has been working a visit as a visiting professor at several business schools including the iims at ahmedabad kozhikod indore raipur and kashipur as well as isb he specializes in marketing and is building blocks encompassing brand management marketing of services technology and creativity entrepreneurship and innovation he runs programs across spectrum school kids executives entrepreneurs and ceos of msmes besides formal teaching at business schools his teaching methodology draws heavily from nature education where immersion is central to learning a particular feature of his pedagogy is enabling the participant to synthesize their own learning rather than achieving a classroom consensus His research interests include brand management, customer education, technology, and how learning happens. In consulting, he work he works specifically in the area of customer education and creating customer experience service capes. Often, this would include veiling technology and complex processes, thus enabling customers to have direct immersive experiences rather than sterile facts and figures. His work also involves specific interventions in complaints handling and tangibilizing intangible customer mindscapes. He has executed interper interpretive programs for Royal Enfield, Lit Little Run of Kutch, Surat Zoo, amongst others. He teaches at over 25 schools, including I am Ahmedabad, I S B Hyderabad, I am Indore, I am Kozhikode, I am Raipur, S P Jain, Sydney, and Dubai and Singapore, Maika, Nirma, and Excelarai. in the most of these institutes from day 1 he has conducted corporate training programs with over 100 of corporates including pepsi bank of baroda abb airtel vodafone indian oil bfl emphasis and tata chemicals specific programs include marketing and customer orientation creatively cracking specific business problems innovations for specific industries complaint handling and presentation skills for digital age marketing he consults predominantly with tiny small and mid sized companies and family run businesses to his teaching training and consulting activities ram kumar brings his expertise from working in the multinational government ngo section 25 and traditionally run private indian private sector settings he is also a serious technical writer specializing in business nature and technology his three books reflect his multidisciplinary orientation politically incorrect children stories exploring the man woman relationship through cooking yin yang and the walk and brand management the devil's dictionary professor ram kumar has been on the board of trustees of the sat charitable trust and has been a founder member of several companies in software and job reskilling he is a nuclear physicist and an mba from iim andabad he currently runs last resort a company that specializes in reversing information entropy gradients besides being a naturalist with two books to his credit he is an avid unicyclist squash and digit digidoo player player angler and a serious woodworker with a full fledged workshop specializing in library and children's furniture he speaks eight languages and is learning his ninth and 10th a very warm welcome sir we are very excited to have you here now i would like to hand over the session to you thank you um uh thanks uh, it's a special um, um pleasure to be with you guys <clears throat> jamshedpur for me means uh, um the tatas i started my career with tatas many many years ago with indian hotels and i've been seri seriously involved with tata chemicals with tata consultancy services with tata motors uh, tata finance tata management training center it's a special pleasure to be in a tata kind of city again uh let me just uh, make this whole thing clear to you uh first is uh, i have a powerpoint deck uh, which has got seven slides i have got 12 photographs 
and then I've got a backup note which I will send you so you don't need to bother to take notes at all. So there are a few slides, there are a few photographs and that's it. So I'm going to bore you to death with a 8000 uh, deck uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, let me start off by first uh, uh, telling you um, why I want to tell what I'm telling you today. I started my career with Matsushita, which is uh, multinational. And then I shifted to the government on a project which is to do with environment. In that, I worked in an NGO. I also set up a Section 25 company. Uh, then I joined, I quit all that, and then joined a, a traditionally run Indian private sector company. And um, after about 13 years of formal work experience, I quit and started on my own 25 years back. Government, multinational, NGO, Section 25 company, traditionally run Indian private sector. There's only one place left, which was to be on my own. And that's how I set up this little company called Last Resort. <clears throat> so I could tell you I made a world class analysis and put all sorts of data together and then finally came to the conclusion that I should be an entrepreneur. That's simply not true. I was I was kicked into it because there was nowhere left to go. And this is my experience with 25 years of working closely with entrepreneurs, um, with funders, with startup companies, and my own uh, experience. So all that I'm telling you is not out of a textbook, it's not out of a journal, it's not out of a case study, it's out of what I genuinely feel every day I get up and work. So let me start with this. Um, no. To share now. Okay. No, it's fine. Uh, you can see this uh, PowerPoint slide. Yes, sir. Okay. So yes, we're starting yeah. off there. Slide one is done. Thank you for having me here. Uh, and we start with the six topics that I'm quickly going to walk you through over the next um, 35 minutes. Uh, the first one is. Entrepreneurship is a gray scale. It's not binary. And I will I will introduce this topic to you quickly in terms of um, how I perceive it. Uh, there is this huge fashion going around. There is this huge virus going around. <clears throat> there is this huge disease going around which says entrepreneurship is the thing to do. And there are all kinds of keywords there. Entrepreneurship, startup, incubator, funding, <laughs> angel investor, spin-offs. All sorts of words out there and uh, it has become almost fashionable and it has become what is called an FMCG almost with even television shows focusing on how you raise money, how you raise capital and how you start up a, a company. Uh, now this is a little bizarre because that's only one tiny small part of entrepreneurship and classically we define entrepreneurship as somebody who creates value. And that value can be social, it can be psychological, it can be educational, it can be religious, it can be in multiple ways. And I just want to force you to think what entrepreneurship could be from um, some examples. Um, are you able to see this uh, picture? Yes. Is this picture visible, please? Yes, yes, sir. Visible. All right. That is a Mongolian band called the Who. They're basically a Mongolian brand, and nobody knows anything about Mongolian brands. These guys jammed up with a Western band, and uh, today they do what is called Mongolian heavy metal, and they have stormed the world. They're a big name. This is Jackson Pollock. A uh, modern artist who single handedly shifted the axis of um, modern art from Western Europe to North America, certified art entrepreneur. This is King Sejong III of Korea, uh, who completely revolutionized the Korean language and made it accessible to the normal people. He completely reinvented the Korean um, 
language in terms of how it is written and in terms of how it's published. This is Virginia Apgar. Most of us are alive today because of her. Uh, she created what is called the Apgar score, which is what physicians use when a baby is born. Apgar is part of her name. Apgar also stands for appearance, uh, pulse, grimace, uh, activity, and R for um, respiration. Instantly, the moment a baby is born, <coughs> every nurse, every physician, every obstetrician, every gynecologist is trained to observe the Apgar score, and that tells you whether the baby is fine, baby needs help, or what kind. All these are entrepreneurs in their own way, whether it is musical entrepreneur, medical entrepreneur, language entrepreneur, art entrepreneur, all of these are entrepreneurs. A business commercial entrepreneurs is only one small part of that whole um, um, spectrum. So there is a whole grayscale of entrepreneurship which spans very, very, very many um, um, areas and um, this is just one part of it. I want to shift us to the next one, which is even worse, which is an even worse head of the dark side of entrepreneurship. Not many people are sure why they want to get into entrepreneurship. They'll say things like, I want to give up my job and get into something on my own. I want to do something on my own. Uh, and there is a small problem there. All right. Uh, we looked at the um, uh, we look at, for example, I want to change the world because they have read John Scully's book or I want to make the world a better place to live in because they read uh, Steve Jobs. I have a dream because they read uh, Martin Luther King. I want to make money because that's what every pop song tells you right from ABBA downwards. Or it says, I want to dominate the world, like Catbird says in, in, in Dilbert. Most of these extraordinarily charismatic people like Steve Jobs and Martin Luther King and um, uh, Bill Gates and you name them, they have created a rock star image around what an entrepreneur is. In addition to that, business schools, for instance, or business uh, management programs, for instance, or even excellence programs, for instance, We'll talk of companies like uh, uh, Apple. They'll talk of companies like Walmart. They'll talk of companies like Ikea. They'll talk of companies like Virgin. For God's sake, these are all extraordinary exceptions to the rule. They are in no way anywhere near the normal. And if we use these as exemplars, if we use these as the as the reason why we want to become an entrepreneur, we are in for a huge disappointment because these are amazingly different companies and amazingly different people. And it's not that all of us can become um, uh, those kind. Closely related to this is this Mark Anthony quote, which says, if you love something and you do what you love, you will never work a day in your life. All right? So if you love something, go ahead and do it. I beg you, I beseech you, I invite you to check this sentence carefully and see what its ramifications are. It is probably the most misleading sentence any wannabe entrepreneur would ever hear. And I'll tell you what happens. Because if you love something and you do it well and you make it your business, that is the end. Because now, instead of doing what you love, you will have to meet payroll. You'll have to check inventory. You'll have to organize production. You'll have to handle pesky employees. You will have to handle pesky customers, the chartered accountant, your banker, the stock market, the board. You will not have a moment to do the thing you love. And worse, quickly you will begin to hate the thing you love because it is just too much work and it doesn't give you any peace of mind or satisfaction. If you really love doing something and you do it well, keep it a secret <laughs> because if the world knows it, they will find out a way to create trouble for you. So be very, very sure 
<coughs> why you want to do what you want to do? And here I have a brilliant picture for you. Um, and I'm willing to bet uh, very few of you would have actually uh, heard about this company or know about these people. This is a white French Jew from France called Debru. And that's his friend, a black Muslim from Kota de Ivoire in Africa called KK Mahmud. When they were studying in Berkeley, they got tired of their studies and they decided to quit and set up a company and they had no idea what company it would be. A black Muslim from Africa and a white Jew from France, they set up this extraordinary company called KK and J. And you really need to check out what their company is, what they do and how they do what they do. And they make a very simple product. They make, you know, these, these things that hold up your trousers. It's got an X at the back and it's got a strap in the front. They make that and they make sock suspenders which hold up your socks and they attach to your shirt. So your shirt stays tucked in all the time. Extremely simple products. They are the world leader in that product. They're a small company based out of New York. And it's a treat to see what they do every day with their product and with their company. The point I'm making is very few entrepreneurs actually know why they're doing what they're doing. They jump into it and most of them regret it. Right? So we have finished two things. We have said first one is it's a gray scale. It is not just make money or business. The second one is you need to be very, very clear why you're doing it. Let's shift to the, um, um, the third one, which is entrepreneurship. It's not all that it is cracked up to be. And uh, here is my um, personal example for you. Uh, I fell in love with woodworking about 15 years back. And today I'm an extremely serious and accomplished woodworker. Right now we are in my woodworking studio. Uh, we are sitting in my office and all the products you see around you are the ones that I make. Uh, so I wanted to be a woodworker and uh, I wanted to make exquisite woodwork. I learned uh, wood carving, I learned wood shaping and all those things. And what I wanted to do was to make stuff like this. This is something I made. All right. And uh, this is actually a picture frame, believe it or not. This is the photographer. He's a surgeon actually and a champion photographer. He wanted me to frame his picture. This is the frame for his picture. This is the kind of work that I wanted to do. That's not how it works. Because I got to manage the environment for it. Forget about the wood, forget about sourcing wood, forget about the machinery, forget about people, forget about um, repairing equipment, forget about all those things. Just managing the environment saps my soul because I've got to handle income tax, I've got to handle GST, I've got to handle international taxes, I've got to handle logistics. People told me to make all this easy, you should uh, go digital and you should set up a website, which I did. Nightmare number two, and they said it's not just any website. You must set up an e-commerce site. So I set up my site on Shopify, and every day, practically six to eight hours of my day, I'm just handling the administrative design and process requirements for that website. I have to struggle to find time to do good work because that is that seems to be the most unnecessary thing in my life. That's what that's what becoming an entrepreneur. That's what the dark side of entrepreneurship is. If you love something and you make that a business very soon, that business will take over your life and then you'll be left with very little time to do the thing that you actually uh, wanted to do. Uh, scaling up saps the soul and here is an interesting um, um, insight. If anybody funds you, they will fund you only under one condition. And let me tell you what it looks like. 
if you go to somebody and say, I'm thinking of experimenting, I'm thinking of learning, I'm trying to, I'm going to do this new stuff, I'm going to do this new thing, nobody's going to fund you. But if you tell them, I've got this thing, it has sold a thousand copies, now I need to set up a factory or a unit or whatever to sell one million copies, everybody will jump over to fund you. Because what they're looking for is how you grow, how you uh, uh, scale up. And whether you look at biology, whether you look at anthropology, whether you look at human settlements, whether you look at mathematics, scaling up saps the soul, scaling up has its own implications. For example, in biology, if you were studying dinosaurs, uh, purely by looking at the size of that fossil, purely by looking at the size of the animal, you could very easily tell whether it was a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. And the reason is very simple. It's because of scaling. Because the larger an animal becomes, the more ponderous, the more heavy, the more slow moving it becomes, and therefore its prey will have to be static. So you can't have a huge animal which is a predator. It will have to eat uh, plants. If you want to eat fast moving animals, if you want to be a sleek and a fast predator, then you have to get uh, smaller and the same kind of analogy or allegory applies across um, organizations, across um, um, anthropological studies, across cities, across um, uh, companies. The larger you are, the more difficult it is to manage and, and execute many of the things that you as an entrepreneur did. Note, I'm not talking about business. If you're running an airline, you need to be around the world. If you're running a hotel, you need to be around the world. If you're running very many activities, you need to be around the world. You can't just be in one place. I'm not again saying that. I'm saying if I wanted to be an entrepreneur, do I realize that apart from the romanticization and the glamorization that goes around, there is also a huge, huge area of um, darkness, which we will have to um, uh, realize, which we will have to recognize, internalize, before we make whatever kind of jump that we um, um, make. It's a deeply personal journey. It's a deeply personal uh, journey. And it is not one. Just a second. A personal journey and. Uh, if one is deciding to become an entrepreneur, you need to look at the dark side very, very carefully because that's where most of the meat lies. Check out empirically. You don't have to believe me. Look at the top 10 entrepreneurs in the world. All of them have been school dropouts. So therefore, if you want to become an entrepreneur with a huge degree and a PhD and several journal uh, articles to your credit, uh, the empirical evidence says it's probably not going to work for you because most of the top entrepreneurs in the world, and you can go up to list 30 or 50 or 100, are all school dropouts because they found that doing stuff in the market is more fun, is more productive than actually uh, sitting and studying something. So if somebody is very well qualified, if somebody has a lot of degrees to their name, that's actually a, a disqualification for becoming an entrepreneur. The second thing is, uh, uh, case studies. And if you look at uh, business school, if you look at management training programs, if you look at uh, management education programs, you'll find a lot of case studies, which is actually quite hilarious. Because case studies are something that you use in something like law, because law is built up on building blocks. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. There's a precedent to it. You can't have a case study in business because you're doing the next good thing. Let me tell you how it works. Two weeks back, I was asked to do a presentation, a little bit of workshop on innovation. So I was discussing with the managers of the program what exactly they would want. So one of the requests was they wanted case studies or innovation. And I jumped out of my skin. You're talking of innovation, which is to see how our company or organization can do something that's never been done before. And you want a case study to tell you how that innovation is to be done. This is something that's quite, um, that's quite um, uh, bizarre. So case study is not going to work. History is not going to work. Backstory is not going to work because what you need to do is something different. What you need to do is something um, 
नेक्स्ट लेवल लॉर्ड ऑफ पीपल विल टेल यू हैव बी हैग्स व्हाट इज दैट बिग हेरी मैसिव गोल्स और दे से ड्रीम फॉर द फ्यूचर एंड एंड थिंक बिग Uh, all this sounds very nice the only problem is there is a huge difference between thinking something and actually executing it all right uh, think of for example this beautiful gujarati dish we call undiyu right or in, or maybe in kerala you might call sort of the same thing called avian right uh, so it feels gorgeous it feels great to think about it uh, it feels very tasty it feels very promising it feels very fulfilling have you any idea of how many vegetables it takes and how many masalas it takes and how many processes it takes to make that undi yeah. right so it's very easy for somebody to say uh, yeah let's have undi yeah. it's a brilliant idea but to execute that idea is virtually impossible you see each of the things behind me here <clears throat> each of them takes ages to actually make up and somebody says ye green mein ho jayega ye blue mein ho jayega table do pahiya ka ban jayega no problem at all for them to say it but actually execute it is extremely difficult which is why we are saying this dream to market business is very 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 uh, difficult the next thing is uh, today it's become fashionable uh, to have a uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship school it is available in uh, uh, in in school it is available in primary school it is available for newborn babies and i'm quite sure there must be a bunch of companies trying to do it for uh, pregnant um, babies in the mothers womb also how they can become entrepreneurs from that uh, stage itself i'm sure that is uh, underway somewhere uh, so they will have classes they will have uh, um, incubators they will have all sorts of things and my question to them as an entrepreneur and as one who's worked with entrepreneurs entrepreneurs is very simple can you learn swimming by correspondence course i do not think you can learn entrepreneurship by <laughs> correspondence course you either become one or you don't and uh, i have a great difficulty in understanding how this works and even some of the terms to me sound very very uh, uh, dangerous it says incubator and from what i know of poultry farming an incubator is where a chick is accelerated or catalyzed i'm sorry an egg is catalyzed to become a chick but then you need a poultry farm to make it grow and as far as the startup business is concerned i can see tons of incubators i can't see a single poultry farm so what happens to the chicks when they get hatched um i think they'll do a correspondence course or uh, something of the lot an entrepreneur needs to learn unlearn and relearn constantly because the market beats you the market beats you every day in tamil we have a saying call veetla padikathava velikaram padipichi kudupa which means what you refused to learn at home the outsider will teach you with a slap and that's exactly what happens in an entrepreneurial journey where what you refused to learn and look at the market and learn spot trends reform change course improve if you don't do it yourself the market makes you do it for them and therefore that is a quality which all entrepreneurs need to have which uh, is the dark side because the people are not most people are not built for learning and learning and relearning <coughs> the trouble also is personal journey wise uh, you can forget about work life balance you can forget about free time you can forget about all this people will airily tell you are uske liye aadmi rakh lo na why don't you hire somebody to do it for you uh yeah it sounds very nice except for three problems the first is employees expect to be cared for nurtured and you even have a department called human relations department which is expected to keep them happy now in addition to the central business that you run as an entrepreneur you need you are in the happiness business <clears throat> second thing is good people cost a lot of money and it's not easy to be able to attract them and retain them it's an extremely difficult and task on its own and here is the third thing which bugs me intensely is that often employees come and tell me either in my company or in other places uh, we give so many ideas to the boss we give so many ideas to the top people but they never implement they never listen 
And my answer to them is very simple. Why didn't you try being a boss for a day? Why didn't you try being an entrepreneur for a day? Because the simple truth is you can walk away at six o'clock in the evening because you're an employee. I am the owner. I have to live with your idea for a lifetime. And there is a extreme extraordinary difference between how an owner and entrepreneur perceives something versus how an employee perceives. Employee can shift jobs. The entrepreneur can't. Employee can walk away at six. The entrepreneur can't. And therefore, that is a huge downside in entrepreneurship where you simply can't give up. If I was to encapsulate it, I would say being an entrepreneur is like being, is like being a parent. There's no promotion. <laughs> there is no free time. You don't get away from that job ever. Right? You have an emotional attachment. It just goes, it's just like being a parent. You just can't walk away from it. So before you have that baby called an uh, entrepreneurial venture, <clears throat> be very, 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 very sure that you've got the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual ability to be able to, to be able to um, um, uh, uh, take it. I'd just like to, uh, um, um, I'd like to devote the last section um, to a, a little bit of less dark kind of um, situation. So you would be very right in asking me if you're painting it so dark, if you're painting it so black, do you mean to say nobody should become entrepreneur, nobody should take the risk, nobody should do something? I'm not saying no. I'm saying be aware of what it is that you're getting into before you do. I have a little silver lining for you and I'm putting my money where my mouth is because that's the area that I'm currently working on. Let me give you a little backstory, two minutes of backstory to, to help you understand what this means. When we think of entrepreneurship, we think of the gigantic corporations of the world, which we started in a garage and became tremendous. Um, in fact, there is one story that I, 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 I got in touch with last week, uh, which is about Chandubai Virani of Balaji Wafers. Uh, the company, his wife used to make the potato wafers and he used to go sell it on a cycle for 25 years ago, exactly 25 years ago. And today that company is uh, is uh, valued at 30,000 crores and their annual turnover is 3,000 crores. Absolutely amazing achievement. Um, anyways, so if you look at the country's employment, you will find, and depending on the study you're looking at, Anywhere between 70 to 85 percent of the employment in India, 70 to 85 percent of the employment in India is in what is called the informal, marginal, or unorganized sector. Only 15 percent of the employment is either in the corporate sector or government, which also accounts for a huge part of the employment, even in that 15 percent, uh, because you've got gigantic corporations like State Bank of India or railways or armed forces and so on and so forth. But 85% of the employment is in what is called marginal, informal, or unorganized sector. And that is composed of your vegetable vendor, tea fellow, the cobbler, the, uh, the auto rickshaw driver, all the people who make the country um, uh, run, the people you see on the road, people you see on the streets, people are running their own businesses. We call them unorganized, informal, or marginal sector. We don't accept they're all bona fide entrepreneurs. And they have jumped across each one of the chasms that we have spoken of in the last five slides, and they managed to jump through it effortlessly. They don't have education much. <clears throat> they don't have any resources. They don't have banking support. They don't have financial support. <clears throat> they don't have um, uh, process support, employees, technology, safety, uh, security. They are on one side. They don't have premises. But they also do marketing, they do finance, they do operations, they do customer acquisition, they do debt management, they do financing, they do inventory management, they do everything that a multinational does, they do. And it is bizarre because if, if they can do these many things without any of the resources that people have, what is it that we actually learn from them? So what I'm doing with an NGO that I've been working with for the last 30 years, ever since I started working formally, I've been with an NGO. It's called Saath. It's based out of Ahmedabad. Uh, we do this uh, incredible project, which is called uh, uh, the, the, the business gym. Uh, it's called the business gym. 
And while we were presenting at some conference, somebody drew this and gave it to us. Uh, it's a, that ex, this explains what the business gym is about. It says these are slum dollars. You build up their bodies using finance and strategy and marketing and accounting and all the inputs that you can give them in very easy to understand formats. Equip them with an app that helps them map both their acquisition and delivery strategies. That builds resilience and self esteem more than anything else, resilience and self esteem. And now that's what the business uh, uh, gym is about. And um, Huh? This is the kind of examples of things that people have come up with. Noxie of this is a guy who's developed his own mobile car wash system. Otherwise, it needs a premise, it needs a pump, it needs a compressor, it needs a lot of pneumatic uh, uh, tubes, and it needs. Now, this guy just turned that whole thing around, put it on a motorcycle. And it's a mobile car wash and his communication equipment is one cell phone. I mean, just how much more innovative can you get? So I'm saying from this sector, there is a lot that we professional managers can learn. So that's what my project is. Part of the project is assisting the, the business gym. We are dealing, we are right now in, in the second version. We are working with over 1000 such nano entrepreneurs who are knife sharpeners or cobblers, who are guys like this car wash, mobile furniture sellers, right? We're working about a thousand of them, trying to push them up. And uh, at the end, what we hope is that we can throw some light on entrepreneurship and make even the smallest business valuable, and something that you can extract value out of, whether the value is money, the value is educational, the value is community services, the value is self-esteem. We can be a true uh, 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 entrepreneur. So as I promised uh, uh, Ms. Asmita, who's been coordinating this whole thing, we said 45 minutes of talk, talk, talk and 15 minutes of Q&A. So I'm done. Uh, thanks, Satan, again for uh, having me. And it'll be a pleasure to take your uh, uh, questions. Um, so after we finish, I will be sending uh, Ms. Asmita um, um, a docket, which will have some of the things that we spoke of in a written form. So that might be the notes that you want to refer to for whatever reason. Uh, I'm done, Ms. Asmita. Over to you, please. Asmita, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Uh, am I audible now? Yep. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that was an interesting presentation. Uh, now uh, the session is open for question and answers. Uh, so please direct your questions to sir. You can also post them in the chat box. You can just unmute yourself and interact. Oh, good afternoon. Good evening, sir. I'm good Abhi. Evening, yeah. Uh, sir, my question uh, to you is these days we see a lot of youngsters, especially the MBA graduates from, you know, premier colleges are taking up jobs in startups rather than, you know, they are uh, directly getting involved with an MNC. So what are your thoughts on that, sir? My thoughts on that? Yes, sir. Yeah, I also date my wife. OK, and any one of these days we are planning on having an extra affair. 
Right. So, sir, you know, uh, like MNCs these days, you know, even um, we kind of facing, you know, I will not say facing issues, but uh, it's become a challenge for us to uh, for establish brands like this to compete with startups because, you know, the major part of these people are now moving towards startups and, you know, they want to work there. So how do you see this uh, for us, like for MNCs to cater to this? What can they do? Uh, uh, I mean, um, um, I mean, let me let me put it like this. Uh, let me rephrase your question so that I can um, pitch my answer accurate, accurately. You're yes. saying, for example, you are a big, technically solid uh, multinational company, and you face a shortage of manpower because they seem to be going and joining startups. Correct? Yes. That's sir. your question. Yes, All right. sir. Uh, in Saat, I also run a credit cooperative bank, Avi. We have got 70 staff. The annual turnover is 45 crore rupees. We have 24,000 members. We have a staff of 70, of which only one, the CEO, Madhuben Parmar, is 12th standard pass. The remaining 69 are less than 8th standard. If you visit me in Ahmedabad, I will take you around and you can see for yourself. All it takes to run a bank. Is a bunch of middle school pass outs. You look at, for example, a brilliant company that you have an absolutely brilliant company that you have called Nesto. I'm a big fan of Nesto's, right? I cannot see. OK, forget this, then I'll be getting into your territory. We just completed a solar cell training course. It's a solar cell cleaning and um, repair refurbishment course. We did that with people, all of whom don't have it, even a 10 standard pass certificate. We did a two week training program for them. Last week, all of them, they got a job in a solar cell company at 8000 rupees. With the express understanding that after six months of internship, they will be setting up their own um, uh, company. So somewhere along, I think Avi, we have to start realizing that uh, some of this education, some of this qualification, some of this is not really necessary. If you don't believe me fully, uh, let me ask you a completely wavered question. <clears throat> If you had the uh, good fortune to be able to assist your senior parents or you know somebody else's uh, senior citizens to undergo medical tests, all right, you will find that the technician pulls out the report and gives you the diagnosis even before you go to the physician. So if it is some senior person's ECG report, the technician will have while pasting it, he or she will have a look at the bilkul barabar, koi problem ni, go ahead. Then you go to the cardiologist or whoever. Who gives you a better opinion or whatever, but essentially that guy knows his job inside out. All right. In the military, for instance, I've had the privilege of watching the Iglas, um, the Iglas platoon in, in, in action. The Iglas is the <coughs> uh, surface to air missile. That's handled by 20 year olds. If our air to well, I mean surface to air missile system can be handled by 20 year olds. I mean, why would why would why would anybody require this? Just take people as they come in. There are enough eager young people are willing to learn to help with their qualifications. Just because they don't know that Ashoka fought uh, somebody in 7th century BC. That's fine. I mean, how does it how does it matter? Let's get over it and let's move on. Correct, sir. So actually, this is the only perception that you know uh, it's in the youngsters, especially that when you, you when you join a startup, you get to learn more than you are working in MNC because it's your you know job description gets very narrowed. Or you need to focus on a one point. So this is the perception you know that is generally among the youngsters. That's right. So maybe shift your target segment of the potential employees. Don't take those. Yes. Take somebody else who would be equally willing to work. Um, I'm facing the same problem because I need somebody who is good with um, 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 Shopify. 
right? Shopify is a software piece of software. It's like tagging yeah. in accounting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, where do I get that guy? I don't because all the people who qualify in software, they want to write software and they want to go to startups and they want to dominate the world. I just want somebody who can handle tally. So I got the tally guy to do Shopify. No problem. 3000 bucks a month. Correct. That's great. Sir. And he doesn't work full time. He comes in only twice a week, two hours a week. So he does Shopify, he does PayPal, he does uh, Razorpay because PayPal is for international payments, Razorpay is for local payments. He tallies the lot, prints out the GST bill, puts it together and takes it away. It charges me 3000 rupees a month, two hours a week, two days a week. I am done. Why would I want to hire somebody from the great International Institute of Software, Hardware Technology with Microsoft certification and I wouldn't need it at all. Great, sir. All right, sir. So I'll um, close my questions here. Over to you, Ashmata. Thank you, Avi. Hello, sir. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, Sudhir here. Yeah. And uh, my question is, I think you have uh, mentioned that uh, when we are into the business, then uh, what happened? Like, you know, we, we start with some dream because we wanted to do uh, something and we we started our business, then later what happens like we are doing, you know, a lot of other things, which which is not our dream. So, you know, like as you said, GST manage, karo, you know, TDS and all these things. But it is again, you know, the part of your the business only. Right. So now what do you suggest? I mean, like say how to remain focused on your dream and to cater based and based to your uh, you know, the customer, uh, I mean, along with, you know, you have other things in side by side, but like how to be focused, how to remain be focused on that? Uh, I, 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 I cannot agree with you more because this is the fight we have every fight with ourselves that we have every day. See, at some point we will have to realize that if you, you, we know this Hindi word called Mazduri. <laughs> Mazduri. We have to understand that's an essential part of life. So if you're eating kheer, you can't pick out only the kismis and the kaju and the madam. You have to eat the whole kheer. All right. Now what happens is people think that if I'm doing a job, I have to do masduri. Whereas if I'm becoming an entrepreneur, then I'm going to be only on my own and do what I like. What, what I'm trying to get across is that that is not true. In a job, I have only one boss. As an entrepreneur, I have 500 bosses. Banker exactly. is also my boss. Chartered account is also my boss. <clears throat> Customer is also my boss. Employee is also my boss. Just like uh, uh, she said just now, right? Em the employee is also my boss. I have 500 bosses now. So therefore, there is no escape from this. So if you want the idyllic thing, I will sit by the riverside and then I will uh, write the poetry. Okay. Unlike, unlikely to happen. Okay. Thank you. Now I have a one more question, uh, sir. I mean, generally, when you when we start a business, we have a small team, and uh, you know, when we start a business with uh, some vision and dream, then what happens? And uh, it's a personal experience that we expect a same thing from the team, and at that time we forgot that you know they are a team and they are an employee. So sometimes we are putting, a, I mean, we are expecting a more. Then we realize it is a creating a pressure on them. And in that situation, we forgot. The yeah, so there's a little break here. Yeah, that happens when we are saying we're in a team and we would like the team to be carbon copies of us. Uh, there is a very beautiful, are you still there, Sudhir? So there are you there? Know, we are getting. Sorry, I think I got disconnected. Sorry, I got yeah, disconnected. Yeah. disconnected. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, now the my the my question is like how to I mean how to manage the team I mean because team is very essential and team is a skeletal of the uh, whatever you are doing. So like yes. how what is your uh, comments on that? That's right. It happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. So there. Uh, as a parent, I want my children to be exactly like me. As a band member, I want everybody to play exactly the rhythm I am playing. 
and this is this is at at some point we will have to realize that you have to let go and let people do their own thing somebody asked the question what about innovation this essentially is the point sudhir ki can you let go or you think you are the greatest in the world so that is where that gap comes in maybe in a team everybody may not think the way you do but it is up to you to realize whether their alternate thinking is actually better than mine or not and that is what some of the greatest people that you are seeing around have been able to do they have been able to harness the energies of people much better than themselves um i have a gift for you sudhir uh, henry ford is supposed to have said what is henry ford's famous comment henry ford's famous comment is you can have a car any color as long as it's black right this lot of people know but there's another statement he made which very few people know and that statement is how come when i want a pair of hands to help me a stupid head comes attached to it what i want is a pair of hands oh mundi kisne manga mundi nahi chahiye mere ko but it's not possible to get just the hands without the mundi mundi is part of that whole whole game so there you have another problem why sudhir people in the military are finding it difficult chain of command as they say chain of command and chain of order even in militaries across the world is becoming difficult to enforce see because the order from the top has to be without question obeyed down the line even that is becoming difficult today because uh, so you say i will innovate mai bandook is taraf marega mai bandook you can't do that for bandook jaha bola you have to shoot there but the point is in some places innovation is acceptable in some places the difference of opinion is not in the military it is punishable as a crime whereas in a corporate situation maybe not but where what you are saying makes me uh, feel very uh, uncomfortable and makes me think so dear is if we look at in religious organizations which of a religion you see when people enter that religious organizations compound everybody behaves the same way and i find this extremely difficult to come to terms with everybody will stand in line and nobody will smoke or spit and nobody will raise their voice everybody will uh, take a bath everybody will quietly stand in line i don't know how it happens there when it cannot happen anywhere else so it is possible it is not that it is not possible something we are not able to harness to make that actually happen which is why i'm saying don't look at entrepreneurship only from commercial point of view look at it from religious point of view sports point of view music point of view language point of view <clears throat> there has been a difference sorry i think mahesh had a question thank you <clears throat> mahesh mahesh parmeshwaran mr mahesh parmeshwaran had a question yes uh, very good evening to you sir and uh, thanks good to evening, the uh, jma sir um you know uh, i have kind of started off on on the uh, business or the entrepreneurship journey around a year back and uh, it's it's like you know quite a interesting uh, question asked by uh, mr sudhir about about uh, expanding the team and uh, taking taking more 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 uh, taking more you know people but at at the same time what is the transition in the sense that the buying into of the of the of the entrepreneurs vision you know for example it's like it's like easy to have a team of two or three and uh, all the people you know have bought into it but then when you scale up expand the things and at the same time try to let go so when when does the entrepreneur decide to articulate what is in his head or or um, you know at times you are kind of profited by winds hitting you from everywhere you know customers chart, chartered accountants uh, so just to just to name two so how do you how do you get out of this loop and uh, explain what is in your head and and especially when um when the when the initial phase might look might look rosy dreamy 
but then but then uh, but then it can be quite an uphill climb and sometimes i i also confess that deep down inside you question yourself as well thank you 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 answered your question i understand how you feel it's like being a parent when I mean, you understand it because you know you know what i'm saying i don't want to articulate it because it sounds mean but sometimes i feel let me just sleep boss just just for today let me sleep after that i'll yeah it is like that chartered accountant doesn't understand your banker doesn't understand your employees don't understand you grow tired of it repeating it again and again and again and again and again and again that's why i'm saying that's a dark side do you want to do that or put that 1 crore rupees in the bank and quietly sit with that interest by the river side writing your poem you choose some of us we can't i'll give you an example mahesh i'll give you a very brilliant example from medical school medical school so when people finish their mbbs and now they have to choose their specialization what they will do in their md so there are some uh, you know gung ho type cowboy types who will go in for surgery because surgery means knife and chainsaw and lights and 20 people giving you instruments and you're running around covered in blood it's a very macho and romantic style are you with me yeah some people like to go that that fellow will never be able to sleep he won't be able to have a meal he won't because throughout his life because that's what it is surgery emergency all the time the smart guys choose skin and vd skin and venereal diseases right because that is very interesting because there is no emergency skin and venereal disease there is no emergency <laughs> plus as as a very naughty person i would add i would add that the patient is never going to die and patient will take a long time to recover also so you have a very much more controlled and comfortable environment whereas as a surgeon you are just bothered all the time because it's emergency all the time that's the way it is you become a teacher what 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 career do we offer for a teacher in the country today so you don't want to become teacher you would rather become insurance salesman or something else or something else because and but that's the life you choose you become a policeman do you know how terribly difficult a policeman's life is um, it is very popular today to talk about the armed forces and their sacrifice to the country respect to them but we should talk of the police also we should talk of the firefighters also we should talk of railway employees also we should talk of airline employees also mahesh how how will it be if your life changes circadian rhythm every two weeks today you are awake at night tomorrow you are awake in the morning third day you are awake in the afternoon it's bizarre but these people all do it with a smile on their face and they are nice to you so do you want to choose that life it is up to you it's entirely up to you i think sometimes i should have been employed somewhere saturday sunday chutti and then do what you want your salary will come on the first of every month how do you feel on the 25th uh, mahesh you so shaken up no yeah because you got to meet payroll you got to make payments you <coughs> so that's what it is so that's a choice you make that's why i'm saying it's a dark side do you want to be on the dark side or do you want to be on the other side uh ms asmita i have a small request okay. of you a lot of people are uh, putting up questions on chat if you yeah. can give me those questions i'll reply to them at leisure in mail or something like that please certainly no issues and uh, but you're doing very well mahesh you are doing very well and i know that you are a very humanitarian employer who's who's got his heart in the right place uh, maybe it won't help you in your business but at least as an example to your own family to your own children to yourself and your conscience i bet you feel damn good about it of course i do in uh, yep. yep i mean uh, yeah when i at times yeah when 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 it gets when it gets tiring and when you are uh, introducing something new something new in the market and uh, you know there are there are so many headwinds because uh people people do not readily want to shift the inertia or inertia of the market chal raha hai chal raha hai chal raha hai but then but then you are trying to do uh, a a you know few new things and uh, at the same time you are also trying to recruit uh people so the so the so the dark side of the entrepreneur wave which has been bought into by me 
question is is it is it necessary or preferable to have the same dark side bought into by your uh, employees as well yes yes let them share the pain no let them okay. share the pleasure because another definition of entrepreneurship is sure losses and uncertain profits <laughs> not just money also in terms of energy also in terms of work also in terms of people uh, behaving rudely with you so all that happens thanks mahesh good talking to you thanks sir thanks sir thank you thank you so much <clears throat> Sir, as you mentioned, there are a few questions in the chat box. Should I read yeah. them? Uh, to, should I take a few? No, I can see all those questions. What I was saying, Ms. Asmita, is if you can print them out and email them to me, I will send you replies or video replies of it, some other point, because we have run out of time. Is That's my suggestion. I have I am comfortable with it. <coughs> Let me just take two of them. Yeah, so, as Mr. many Pritish, as you like. Mr. Dujesh asks, how do you see technology integration as a prerequisite to being successful and scale up? Once more, please. So, Dujesh is asking, how do you see technology integration as a prerequisite to being successful and scale up? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a, that's a, for an entrepreneur, that's a very tough question because uh, invariably the technology, two conditions are there along with it. One is in terms of capital investment. And the second one is in terms of obsolete, being obsolete, getting obsolete, and you will have to um, go to the next uh, uh, generation. These are two questions that haunt every entrepreneur. My personal suggestion, which I have seen, which I have wherever I have been able to convince people, I have tried and it has worked very well, is that if you can do it without technology, push it as hard as you can, and the day you simply cannot do it. Then you pick up technology because that's when you really can figure out whether it makes sense or um, not. This could be for anything, Brijesh. Um, uh, it could be for a simple special purpose machine that you buy. Like, for example, I am, I am now ready to buy an oscillating drum sander because I know that I simply cannot continue with hand sanding anymore because it's not going to give me that level of finish and quality. I'm just forget about that. So one is push it as hard as you can till you realize that now I have to buy the technology. And second, be prepared that that technology is going to get obsolete very, very fast and you will have to upgrade. This upgrade may not necessarily be promoted or accelerated by the supplier. This upgrade may come out of your own conscience. You will buy the slow laptop machine and in two months you'll realize this is not good enough. You need the faster one. And another two months you'll realize, you no, know, you need a still faster one. So that is that is one 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 way of answering the question. The second way of answering that question is in some ways technology is a threshold which you have to acquire to be able to compete in that market. Then you don't have an option. If you're dealing with, for example, products like uh, biotech products, if you're dealing with, for example, agricultural uh, inputs, that technology is a prerequisite you cannot do without it. And therefore you will have to um, um, acquire and use the technology. But uh, overall, I'm highly suspicious of any technology that seeks to convert, um, that seeks to, that that promises miracles. Technology doesn't, it's only, the tool is only as good as the operator who is using it. And therefore, it has maintenance, it has consumables, it has spare parts, it has uh, uh, consumable product, uh, consumable material um, uh, quality requirements. It has a lot of things con connected to it. It's not just technology. The fourth thing is, Brijesh, you also need to know whether our organization or our staff or I, whether I am compatible with that technology. For example, you will find enough number of companies which say our helpline is open from 10 p.m. to 5 p.m. at 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. I find that ridiculous. If you have a helpline, but definition is 24 by 7, no? It's like saying our ATM works only from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. That doesn't make any sense. ATM means 24 by 7. And so therefore, you will also have to see whether you are comfortable with that technology. For example, in my, um, I told you about the business I run, this woodworking business. So I've got Shopify. Shopify is 24 by 7. <clears throat> Do I have to reply 24 by 7? I have to reply 24 by 7 because that's what the other guy is expecting. No? Because they might be in New Zealand, they might be in um, Ghana, they might be in Greenland. I can't tell them to no, go my so <laughs> <laughs> you can't 
you can't use those responses. So you also need to make sure whether you are going to be in sync with that uh, technology. Thank you, sir. I think I hope it answered uh, his question. So there's one more. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Rajesh ji, are you speaking something? <coughs> no, I said yes, it answered my question very well. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Thank Ramkumar. you so much. Thank you so much. It will be a pleasure to be in touch with all of you guys because this is something that hurts every day. Every day it hurts. See, I, I'm not an entrepreneur. I see somebody who's an entrepreneur and I feel bad. I am an entrepreneur. I see a bigger entrepreneur. I feel bad. What every day I just feel bad because some so that is the whole game because it has become a fashion, it has become a trend, it has become public discourse. Ki log yehi baat kar rahe, entrepreneurship, uh, what is that? Startup, uh, funding, mezzanine round, angel investing. God knows where everybody learns all this. Usko padne ke liye bolte wo nahi padta hai wo. Jo kaam pe seekhne ka wo nahi seekhta. But yeh sab pata nahi kaan se leke a jate hai and they are constantly talking of this. And it has almost become popular TV shows. Ki chalo apne backup, wo kya bolte hai? Funding, funding khelte hai chalo. Well, let us play startup startup kill them. So there you are. Right. Uh, so the Murli, uh, Mr. Murli has a question. Uh, he says your take <coughs> on the innovation case studies was humorous, but would you like, uh, but would you like, would he would like to know how you perceive innovation that has to be brought about? Is it all about individual motivation and the drive only? Uh, Yes, Murli, it can be external, it can be internal. External is when the market beats you and says your, your product needs to improve, otherwise I will not buy from you. Or I am buying the other guy's product because that's much better than your product. Then you are beaten into submission and you have to innovate. But that's a very poor form of innovation. The real innovation happens when it comes from deep within you and you realize Ki, this is something that I can do, I must do, I will do, and you test it out. And then, and based on the kind of resources you have, it's very, very possible to do it. And uh, uh, one minute, Murli, here I want to, maybe at some point we can have this discussion in a deeper sense because I don't want to mislead you on this. Innovation can also mean classic and retro. So it's not necessarily that innovation simply means the material changes, the design changes, the outlook changes, the engineering specs change, and it becomes something else. Innovation could very well be how you keep that style and how you keep the product and how you keep the thing as it was 100 years ago. So it retains that classic. That is also innovation. You may keep the product the same. You may innovate the packaging, which is also entirely possible. You might keep the product same. You might change its uses. So there are very many vectors on which you can innovate. The common misunderstanding is our car has to get faster, uh, bigger, uh, more leather, uh, more chrome, that is not, I, I, I mean, that's one way of innovating, but that's not maybe the most innovative form of public transport is when you don't need public transport at all because you are an integrated community that can walk and cycle. You don't need transport at all. So that innovation cuts in several, several ways. <clears throat> Let me just um, give you a good example, which I can't resist giving you about what, what, what I mean by this. There is a very fascinating example of a, uh, a uh, city in Netherlands called Drachten and uh, they had this problem because they were right in the middle of a busy highway and they had a lot of accidents in which uh, I don't know maybe 20 or 30 people died every year because they were in the highway and the, the vehicles would go by. So the uh, chief of uh, town planning, he was given the task, he please do something, you know, we can't either build a bypass or some way of making sure these accidents don't happen. So he did something and this experiment is nearly 20 years old, which even today people can't believe after it has happened. What he did was for the roads, the highway that went through the town, he removed all the signboards, he removed the divider, he removed the road lines, he removed the pavement, he removed the stoplight, he removed every form of traffic information signage there was. No pedestrian crossing, no stoplight, no divider, nothing at all. Not one accident has happened in the last 12 years. For the simple reason that if you remove the divider, then you will slow down. Which side should I go? <coughs> if you remove the pedestrian crossing, 
you will see people crossing and therefore you will maintain eye contact and slow down. If the turn signal or speed limit is not indicated, then you will automatically slow down so that you are safe. Is that innovation? I think that's fantastic innovation. There's no doubt about it. In 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 in, uh, I'll just close with this one. This is my favorite. In uh, Norway, for instance, if you are caught speeding, uh, the police stop you. Uh, they ask you not for your driving license. They ask for your social security card, because linked to that and which can be read by police uh, scanners, they can read your income. And your fine is a percentage of your annual income. So if you cross the red light or if you're speeding, that might be 10% of your annual income. If you're a middle class person earning maybe small amount, then you'll have to pay only small amount. But if you're a guy earning a billion dollars a year, your traffic fine will be $10 million a year. So it hurts. I mean, that's the way traffic fine should be all over the world. It should be a percentage of your income so that you shiver in your pants before committing traffic offense. Otherwise, the rich guy will just, okay, take the whole year's fine and don't bother me again. So that is innovation. So not doing something is also innovation. Amazing, amazing example, sir. So there's a last one. Uh, somebody wants to know, Mr. Amarjit Singh, he wants to know the key factors to become a social successful social entrepreneur. Ah, that is really surprising because uh, the Sikh community is uh, world famous for the kind of uh, social entrepreneurship it does in very simple, straightforward and solid ways. Right? Um, so, yeah. So, but let me not uh, dwell on that. Let me give you another example for social entrepreneurship. Uh, see, I, I completely agree with I know how it is to be hungry. I know when I have not had the money to eat, that's why I went hungry. So I know what it is to be hungry without money, not because you have a meeting or something and you can't eat lunch. But the point is, if you keep doing that, feeding people just uh, food and giving them some bicycle and some something, I, I mean, I understand that and I completely agree with it and I want to do it, but then we cannot push up people to See, we want graduates like in the bank I spoke about. We are very particular that we have graduates. Usually banks will very proudly say this is our customer since 25 years. We say no, 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 no. We are a small credit cooperative bank. We want our customers to graduate. We want them to be with our bank, grow their business, leave us and then become investors. We don't want them sitting here as customers. Similarly, even in SAT as an NGO, even in this business gym, we want people to be graduates. So therefore, Amarji, the thing is, if you can focus your mind, how will I make the people I'm going to assist, I'm going to help, I'm going to train, I'm going to support, they should graduate. And tomorrow they should be better off than they were and they should be able to help others. How do I do that? That should be the motive of any social, um, whoever you're dealing with, whatever group you're dealing with, men, women, children, senior citizens, disadvantaged people, all that is fine. But this is one thing that we are completely unable to do is to create graduates. We are creating dependencies. It's like a ration card, ration card for life. Are kabhi to dekho yaar, aadmi aage bad gaya tha, abhi usko ration card ki jarurat nahi hai. Now he has to graduate and so that is, uh, and that is something that uh, would be really brilliant and that uh, very few people are actually doing team. We will support you. Now you get up, move on your own feet and come back and help other people. Kyunki hami kitne din karte rahenge. So maybe that could uh, answer some part of your question. Chakde phatte. <laughs> you should get them to check the phatte, not we are doing the chakde phatte all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering all the questions, sir. So I would now request uh, Ms. Avi Shekhar, uh, who's deputy engineer at uh, SWP and also a managing team member of JMA to please uh, thank our speaker and the audience today. Yeah, hi, sir. Hi. So just like, you know, how we start each day with a uh, with a grateful heart, I express my gratitude towards you on behalf of Jamshedpur Management Association for giving us the time and, you know, such a thought provoking session, if I can call it, you know, it's in the air. Everybody's talking about startups. Everybody's talking about entrepreneurship, but what we 
all of us are missing out is the darker side, the you know the uh, negative part of the entrepreneurship. So you know, just like how you said that business or commercial entrepreneurship is just one part of entrepreneurship. Yes, I totally agree with you, sir. Even <coughs> a dentist who own his or her own uh, clinic is an entrepreneur. So and so lovely to see your woodwork in the background. I've been, you know, gazing into all those, you know, trying to even see the tiniest of the, those plates that you've just kept over there. Uh, it's kind of uh, all those woodwork on the top, especially the kind of, you know, the art, the the intricate details that you've done in the designing is all love. I hope I am going to visit your Shopify profile one day and, you know, just check on uh, the woodwork, the kind of work you've been doing. Definitely, sir, this session has given us a food for thought and I'm going to go back and I have been really excited to, you know, listen to you looking forward to the topic. I joined five, ten minutes earlier and I kept my calendar, uh, you know, free that I have to listen to uh, this topic and just uh, I mean it, it was kind of very interesting and the way you presented it as it was lovely to hear all of us on behalf of everybody present here thank you so much sir thank you so I also, much I also thank yeah. all the participants we had more than 50 plus listeners today on the session thank you to all of them for making this a grand success over to you sir you were saying something no, no I was just saying thanks to you most welcome, sir. So we are going to come back to you because, uh, you know, you've given us a lot of topics that we are going to come back. There was somebody who's, who's written about your viral marketing lecture. So I think that is one topic that I'm going to take it up and call you again for another session. Sure thing. It'll be a pleasure to interact with you guys. Thank yes, you so sir. much and all the very best. And uh, special thanks to Ms. Asmita because she's been following this up and making sure the whole thing uh, sat well and everything. Thank you again, ma'am. And uh, this damn thing worked. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, That's indeed. A between us. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> right. Thanks, so, thank you. Bye. And thank have you. a great weekend, everybody. Sure. Thank you, sir. Looking forward to more such events in future. And thank you to all our participants. I have shared the feedback form in the chat box. Please do fill it. Uh, your feedback is really valuable. <coughs> too. Thank yeah. you so much. Have thank a great so evening. Bye bye. Bye bye, sir.